Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, if you're black, you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. An omission from Theresa May soon after becoming Prime Minister. So will the final report from a major review commissioned by Downing Street and carried out by the Labour MP David Lammy change anything? The report makes more than 30 recommendations, including allowing some prosecutions to be dropped. Well, this short film explains the scale of the problem. That's the question Labour MP David Lammy has been looking into. And here's what he found out. Let's start with convictions. For every 100 white women convicted at Magistrates Court, there were 122 black women, 142 Asian women, and 111 mixed ethnic women. Turning to prison sentences. The report found no link between ethnicity and the likelihood of receiving a prison sentence for most crimes. But when it came to drug offences, ethnic minorities are around 240% more likely to be sent to prison compared to white offenders. And finally, high security prisons. Ethnic minority male prisoners are more likely to be placed in high security prisons. And for every 100 white men sent to prison for public order offences, there were 417 black men and 631 Asian men. The review says ethnic minority individuals still face bias, including overt discrimination in parts of the justice system. Lamy argues there needs to be more scrutiny for those working in courts and prisons. Well, here's the report's author, MP David Lamy, speaking a little bit earlier on on BBC Breakfast. We've now created a situation in our country where 41% of our youth prison system, that's young people as young as 10 and as old as 18, is from a black or minority ethnic background. I mean, that's more than double the amount of black and ethnic minority young people in our country. That is a significant issue and it suggests that our adult prison population will grow as well if we don't try and do something about this. The Ministry of Justice has welcomed Mr Lamy's report, saying the recommendations are thorough. The Secretary of State for Justice, David Liddington, says the MOJ wants to eradicate all injustices within society. What struck me about the report, too, was the reality that very large numbers of British people from our black and ethnic minority communities lack confidence in the criminal justice system. No minister, no government of any political colour can be happy with that state of affairs. We need to address that problem. Uh, David Lammy's recommendations offer a possible route for, for, for doing some of that and we'll be responding in detail to every item of his report. Well, let's speak to Jeremy Crook, who is CEO of Black Training and Enterprise Group. They go into prisons, young offenders institutions and schools to do mentoring and rehab. And we can also speak to Helen Beresford, who is Director of Engagement for the social justice charity NACRO. Thank you both for coming in. Jeremy, first of all, is there discrimination in the justice system? Is there a perception of it or is it a reality? It is a reality and it's definitely a perception. Uh, we spoke to many uh, black and Muslim men in prisons who face discrimination. You can also look at the uh, prison inspector reports every year which show clear bias in prisons and complaints towards how uh, black and um, Asian prisons are treated every year. So uh, I think there's no doubt that there is overt uh, and, and unconscious uh, issues in, in prisons for uh, black and Asian uh, prisoners. So I welcome the report because it's clearly put a real spotlight on this issue and the need for prisons to be uh, to reflect our communities which are very diverse to appreciate race and faith differences 
to better assess uh, prisoners when they come into prison uh, in, at first and make sure that the best possible practical solutions are put in place to make sure that those prisoners can be re rehabilitated and given the best support and not face further issues of discrimination and bias in prison, which they've often faced outside. Uh, and make Just sure explain those experiences in prison that you're hearing about, because I'm sure lots of people watching are thinking, well, how are people who are black or Asian treated differently in prisons? I think in terms of how, uh, how a prisoner is actually given opportunities to go and get learning, um, to uh, have opportunities to work in prisons, they feel that it's often based on privilege and, and, and the bias of particular prison officers giving opportunities to particular prisoners, often white rather than black or Asian. And I think also in terms of if they are from a Muslim background, for example, is their faith really understood by prison officers who are not from a Muslim background, who don't really understand their faith and their needs, and therefore can often disrespect that faith and their individuality, and therefore not give a, a full proper service to those individuals. So I think the stereotyping of black men and Muslim men and women in our society is, is also permeates prisons as well. So we shouldn't be surprised by that, but it's about making sure that prison officers are given the right training, the right support, to make sure that it can meet the needs of individuals fully so we don't have men coming out of prison re-offending at higher rates because they're black or Muslim but also when they're in prison they can really get the support and development that they need and be treated respectfully with dignity. Well let's talk before they even get into prison because one of the issues that's raised in the report Helen is about this trust deficit. David Lammy suggesting that more black defendants would plead guilty and therefore get a discount on their sentence if they had faith that mm. the judge that they were before or the magistrate they were before yeah. would give them a reasonable and fair sentence. That's right. And first I would say, like Jeremy at NACRA, we, we really support the launch of this report. It's really important that we actually look across the whole justice system and beyond, as you say, before people enter the justice system, and also the effect afterwards, including the criminal records regime, of actually what that means in terms of disproportionality in the system. You're right, David Lammy rightly highlights this issue of a trust deficit. We know this at NACRA from our work with disadvantaged young people and adults across the country, that actually there can be this confusion, this issue, this mistrust around engaging um, with certain statutory services. In particular, we find that this is with the police, but actually the impact of that mistrust with the police is across all of the justice system and all of statutory services as well. So once you've had a negative experience of something like that, actually you're, more, you're less likely to engage positively in the future. So how do you change that? Is it something as simple as saying, let's get more black and ethnic minority officers in the police, judges, magistrates, or is that too simplistic? That's, that's fundamentally important. We do need more police officers, we do need more prison officers, more magistrates, more judges. So I think David Lamb is very right to say that has to be addressed and there should be a target to reach that by 2025 in the, in the case of judges. We work with the police in London to try and make sure uh, the community looks at the police as a, as a career option. but. You know, we, we have only 6% of officers in the country who are from black and Asian backgrounds, so we need to do a lot better. But clearly we have to improve stop and search. Stop and search is the real issue that diminishes trust in the police, and for not just for young people, but for older people. So if we can get a grip on stop and search and reduce that and make sure it's targeted and, and it looks at criminals rather than the whole community, that will be a real step forward. But it's not just about the numbers, because it's about leadership, and it's about prison governors, the Secretary of State, the chief of the probation service and, and the prison service really saying this is something that we must make some progress on we must do it now because this has been an issue for a very long period of time we've been working on it for four years through something called the young review and we've seen very little progress in terms of the outcomes for young black and muslim men for example Helen, I want to pick up on a couple of controversial elements of this, which mm. some people may read this and say, mm. well, this doesn't seem fair. Things like prosecutions being deferred, people not being sentenced until they've taken part in a community mm. programme, reducing those sentences. Mm. Things like sealed criminal records, where after you've served a certain amount of time, maybe if you can prove you've moved on, then employers wouldn't necessarily know you've got yeah. a criminal record. Some people will feel uncomfortable with that. I mean, I think the thing to say, but if I start with criminal records, we have a very complex, very confusing, and really very arbitrary system of criminal record disclosure at the minute. It has huge impacts on how people move on from a life where they were involved in crime, where they want to move on to a positive future, but actually are quite often held back by having to disclose, or indeed not knowing when to disclose, having employers who don't know um, what the rules are, what they have to do, and 
therefore are more likely to be risk averse in terms of employing people who have previously had criminal records. So actually, we know from our work, we run a resettlement advice service, both advising individuals and employers on their rights and responsibilities here. But actually, we know that we have to have fundamental change. If we want to give people a chance to move on, to, to not reoffend again, to get a job, you know, one of the core things about rehabilitation and moving on to a life after crime, we need to get those things right. So absolutely support a fundamental review of the criminal records regime and also looking at this new option around sealed disclosure. Thank you both for coming in um, and talking to us this morning about that. Thank you. Well, we can speak now to Nazir Afsal, former Chief Crown Prosecutor for the North West of England. Patrick Williams is Senior Lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. Malcolm Richardson is Chairman of the Magistrates Association and Dal Babu, former Chief Superintendent with the Metropolitan Police. I want to start, um, Nazir, by speaking to you, if I may. Clearly, there are big issues in terms of representation of ethnic minorities within the police, the criminal justice system. Tell us about what you've experienced yourself. Um, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I, I totally accept much of, well, mo most of what uh, Mr. Lamy says. Let me start with um, diversity. Uh, there is not one chief constable from a minority. At the senior ranks, very few, uh, as Dow will know. Uh, there is one P police and crime commissioner out of the 43 or 42 uh, that's from a minority. Uh, if you go into the prison service, again, at the very senior levels, very few. At the Ministry of Justice, very few. Uh, the only organisation uh, that I think gets this right is the Crime Prosecution Service, my former organisation, which has a very diverse workforce at the senior ranks. I think that has an impact. So if you have a diverse more understanding workforce in the agencies that tackle justice, I think they have a better understanding of the people that come before it. To give you one example, I had to get rid of a district judge three or four years ago because he insisted that a person called Patel should be called to give evidence, a witness called to give evidence at very short notice. And when we said that that person couldn't come, he said, well, surely she only works in a shop. And that's the kind of unconscious or conscious bias that the system has in its place and if you, you can tackle that through diversity you can tackle that through transparency so the more that you know I'm, I'm personally in favor of televising proceedings with pro appropriate safeguards you can see what's happening in your name in courtrooms you can see what uh, might not be happening you might understand the decisions that are being taken and that ultimately builds trust which currently clearly is lacking well let's talk about that because the trust deficit is the big one of the big issues in this report isn't it um, Patrick, do you think that, as David Lammy says in the report, more ethnic minority uh, people would stand up and plead guilty if there was a greater representation because they would trust they would get a fair sentence rather than pleading not guilty and going before a jury? Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, and my involvement within this Lammy review has seen me speak about much of the research that I've been involved with and also involved with the Lola or the Young Review. Um, I guess the question of trust is extremely important and I guess Lamy talking about the notion of trust isn't a new question. We can see it emerged in the Macpherson report. Um, Scarman before then spoke about the notion of trust. So I guess what we do recognise is that there's a reality that young people, black, Asian, minority, ethnic individuals will recognise that justice somehow has been stolen for them. It's extremely difficult for them to get well, a similar yeah, yeah. experience of justice when compared to their white counterparts. Yeah. I, th I think that's a really, really important point. If you look at the number of reports, as Patrick says, if you look at McPherson, you look at uh, Scarman, you look at the CRE report, the Morris inquiry, uh, and now we've got the Lamy report, all of them are basically saying the same thing. It's about uh, representation, it's about increasing trust. So why is it not changing? And, and, and it's not changing. And uh, Nazir's point is really, really important. If you look at the number of chief constables, uh, we haven't got a single uh, ethnic minority chief constable in the country. We had one uh, in Kent, Mike Fuller, and he retired. So we've, we're now in a position where we haven't got a single chief constable. Are enough coming through the ranks? Yes, well, you see, I think, Chloe, I think we need to nail some of the myths. That well, that's why I'm, well, exactly what I'm asking. But we were talking about this earlier on, and we were talking about the numbers of people from ethnic minorities going to the police force, and it's tiny, isn't it? Well, if you look at the new figures, um, a third of the people who apply are from minorities. So I think the chief constables will say, oh, yeah, people aren't coming through. They said that when I joined the police. You know, they, 35 years ago, they said, oh, we need a whole generation to change it. Here we are, a generation, a couple of generations on, and we haven't changed it. So I think we've had a very, very different approach when it comes to gender. Uh, the three most senior positions in policing 
are occupied by women. A quarter of the chief constables in this country are now women. Now, when I joined, we didn't have any minorities and we didn't have any women. So I think we need to look at some of the lessons around how... I mean, we, we, we're still way behind where we should be in terms of gender equality, but we need to look at some of those lessons that, that are there. And I think what really worries me is that with this report, like all the other reports that we've had, will, be, will gather dust and we won't actually see any action. Uh, and, I, and I'm just worried now that people will say, look, do we need another report? Do, do we, we just need to get on. If you just go back to the recommendations mm -hmm. in any of the reports I've mentioned and just say, right, we're going to implement those recommendations, we wouldn't be sitting here and having this discussion. But can I just make a point? Because there's something, sorry to jump in, there's something about the idea that if we increase the numbers of black, Asian and minority ethnic mm. practitioners, then this will solve the problem of mm. bias, inequality, discrimination within the system. But if we look at the example of women mm. who have taken up senior positions within the criminal justice system, the experience of women who are mm. offenders within the system is still extremely mm. damaging um, and has a wide impact upon the woman herself, mm. but also her family. Well, let, let's hear from, so from Malcolm question, yeah. from the, the Magistrates Association. Um, I mean, f firstly, you know, there is a much better news story from the magistracy in terms of um, ethnic uh, brain, uh, range within the magistracy. But there's now, not with regards trust, is there? Because this no, is exactly no, what the, the Lamy report absolutely. is saying. They so don't trust magistrates, come, to be fair. Let's come back to... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure he's necessarily saying that, but let's come back to... But the, he is I, saying there's a trust deficit I, I, where I he is saying that... Yes, I black completely endorse men that. Men and women mm. and Asian men and women who are guilty, who would plead guilty if they thought they were going mm. to get a fair sentence, are being put off, and that's why they're going to a jury system. Uh, I, I accept that. What I don't necessarily accept is that that's because they don't see enough black and other ethnic minorities on the bench. Uh, we have to believe as a society that we can create a judicial system which delivers fair sentences irrelevant of the colour or the gender or the age or frankly the class of the person who is or the tribunal that's administering it and if we can achieve it with juries we can achieve it on the bench what David is saying in his uh, report and we thoroughly endorse this is there isn't enough evidence of what happens in magistrates courts you know, there, yes, there's disproportionality. Where does that come from? We don't know whether it's because the people who come before us from minority groups um, come with more previous convictions, come uh, charged with more aggravated offences. We just don't know, and we need to know. I want to just raise a couple of issues, if mm. I can, and I want to, to bring Nazir back in. Some people who will look at this report, and there's 30 recommendations, it's a, a, a huge old report, Talking about sealed criminal records, so the idea that people could go and say, I have, sit before a judge and say, you know, I, I'm terribly remorseful, I've moved on, I've changed, therefore employers potentially wouldn't know they had criminal records. And also the idea of um, prosecutions being deferred, so mm. if you did some kind of community action, some programme, some drugs programme, you would get a reduced sentence. Some people watching this will feel uncomfortable with that. OK, starting with the first one, um, very much uh, in favour of sealing where it's appropriate to do so. Um, you wouldn't do it where, the, where people have uh, care of children, for example, those kinds of employments where they're working with the vulnerable people. But certainly one of the issues is to help people prevent reoffending, to help them get on with their lives and rehabilitate themselves, you've got to give them the opportunity to get a job. And certainly so many employers immediately just turn off the moment they see a previous conviction. So sealing appropriate where judges think it's appropriate to deliver. On the, on the other issue... Uh, uh, forgive me, I forgot what the other issue was. Um, uh, deferring prosecutions. Yes, deferred prosecutions. Well, we had conditional cautions, and we still do, uh, which is something very similar, where you send somebody for treatment rather than prosecute them or caution them. Uh, and I think, sadly, the issue with that was it was done in the dozens rather than the hundreds. There weren't the services available. There weren't the drug treatment centres, the alcohol treatment centres, the mental health issue uh, uh, centres available to send people, so prosecutors just simply prosecuted, and police officers just simply charged. Uh, I think I'm very much in favour of deferred prosecutions. It currently exists, would you believe it, for the very rich companies because they can go to the serious fraud office and reach a deferred prosecution agreement with them, which means that they won't be prosecuted if they pay 100 million or 200 million. That's not right. It should be available for 
those who are just starting up, sadly, on their criminal careers, who have no previous convictions, who may have issues such as alcohol or drugs or mental health. And if we can find the means by which we can treat those issues, then it's absolutely right that we should give them the chance, which prosecu deferred prosecution doesn't mean they won't be prosecuted. It means that you won't be prosecuted unless uh, you take the treatment and ultimately uh, stop offending. I think class, class is a very important factor, uh, um, and I think what, what we need to be looking at is the deprivation element of this. Because in, in some ways, whether you're black or white is, is neither here or there. If you're poor, you're more, more likely to be within criminal justice. If you're looked after, you're more likely to be within the criminal justice system. And I think one of the things that does worry me about the report is the aspect that you could have two offenders, one black, one white, and we could have a potential, if the recommendations are taken on board, and I'm not, in, I'm not in sure we had a discussion outside, I'm not even sure that they will be taken on. We had a very, very lukewarm response from the government because, as Nazir has said, this is about resourcing, resourcing those additional services. And I don't think this government uh, has shown any desire to do that. Now, that, that, that may be, that I may, may have interpreted that wrongly, but what we need is that support for those individuals who will then need yeah. that, who, who don't need to go to prison. And class, I think, is fundamental here. So whether you're black, whether you're white, or whether you're Asian, if you're poor, you're more likely to be in, in prison can and convicted. Can I make a point there? Can I just jump in? Because there is some of the analysis that Lamy has undertaken mm. clearly demonstrates that, like for like, Black, Asian and minority mm. ethnic individuals will experience the criminal justice system differently. Mm. And my argument and some of the work that we've contributed to this review mm. was the reality that in London, for example, the vast majority of young black men are constructed and viewed as gang involved. If they're constructed and viewed as gang involved, therefore, then they mm. are exposed to collective mm. punishments like joint enterprise. The CPS could speak to some of those issues. What we know is that there are individuals in the campaign organisation Gemba can demonstrate that there are individuals who are serving custodial sentences, one because they are black and two because they are constructed as being involved in gangs. These individuals have, are not guilty of offences. So going back to the trust issue, it's extremely difficult to engage in processes and notions of trust when we know that the police and the criminal justice system target and respond to black so it, and Asian minority. It all needs it all needs breaking down. We need a size yes. Shift. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. I'm very grateful to you. And thank you also to Nazir speaking to us from Salford. ...and roll this out right across the system. My final theme is responsibility. In particular here, I'm thinking about the role of adults around children who find themselves in trouble. Parents are the starting point for this. When children are being drawn into street, street crime, parents must be there to set boundaries for their children. But large parts of the youth justice system appear to have given up on parenting. Last year, 55,000 young people were found guilty in the courts, but just 189 parenting orders were issued by the youth justice system. Only 60 involved black, Asian or minority ethnic young people. The idea behind parenting orders is that they provide both challenge and support to parents. If the system has lost faith in them, then they need to be replaced quickly with something else. The youth justice system must also be much more rooted in local communities. Data should be shared not just with other public services, but also as part of the conversation with local people about how to cut crime, including reoffending. Hearings could be held more locally using buildings such as libraries or community centres. Selected people with an appropriate interest in a child should be invited to attend the hearings of youth offender panels so that they can observe, advise and be held accountable for their own role in rehabilitation. For example, if an offence has been committed in school hours, teachers or the head teacher should be brought in to discuss the role of the school in preventing further offending behaviour. And whilst the system does not, whilst, and while the system does more to work with parents and communities, it also needs to do more to protect children from exploitation. I sat with parents who feel powerless about their children being drawn into street crime by duress. One mother told me she was trying to move house, actually move from London to a completely different city, 90 miles away, to stop 
her son being drawn into selling drugs against his will. Last year, nearly three quarters of police forces arrested under 16s for selling crack, heroin or cocaine. Cocaine. These drugs come from somewhere. We need to focus more on the adults responsible for this, the hardened criminals who are moving weapons around our country and sending youngsters out to push drugs. The tools are there, it seems to me. Modern slavery legislation must be used to prevent the exploitation of vulnerable children with much more focus, not just on the young children and the street crime, but on the powerful adults further up criminal hierarchies. Most of all, ex-offenders need the chance to take responsibility for their own lives. An essential part of this is finding and holding down a job. But I found our criminal records regime holding back those from all backgrounds. Over the last five years, 22,000 black, Asian and minority ethnic children have had their names added to the National Police Computer Database. But half of all employers would not consider employing someone with a criminal record. I'm not the only one to call for reform. In his review on the youth justice system, Charlie Taylor called for a sharper distinction between adults and children. I support that. But there should also be more flexibility in the system. I recommend that we learn from the approach in parts of the United States. There should be an opportunity for ex-offenders to come before a judge or an organisation like the Parole Board to prove that they have changed and apply to have their records sealed in all but the most serious cases. There is more that I could say this morning, but I've spoken long enough. I want to end by thanking all of those who've contributed to this review, from the many organisations outside government that have given their time and energy to my advisory panel, who have been invaluable in supporting me over this process. In some ways, this is the end of the process with the report published today. But it must also be the beginning of something. If we're going to make the progress we need on this issue, I will continue to make the case for change as the government considers its response and begins to implement the recommendations. But the voices in this room will be just as important in ensuring that this issue does not slip back down the agenda, but that it remains a priority in the years ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Well, David Lammy, the uh, Labour MP, uh, revealing the findings of his inquiry uh, ordered by this uh, Conservative government into why the criminal justice system uh, seems to disproportionately uh, hit people from black and ethnic minorities. And here uh, in the second hour of All Out Politics, I'm joined now by Sky's political correspondent Tom Rayner. Uh, Strong diagnosis of the situation there from uh, David Lammy. What are the solutions he's proposing? Well, he's put forward 35 recommendations, Adam. I think it's worth remembering this was commissioned uh, in the context of that speech that Theresa May gave when she first became Prime Minister in the street of Downing Street, where she identified uh, the unfairness uh, in the British criminal justice system, particularly to black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And what David Lammy's done is, on the one hand, look at the statistics and also make some recommendations. Uh, and he's really focused in, based on those, some of those statistics, on some certain key areas. One of the biggest ones is the youth justice system. He points out that black, Asian and minority ethnic people make up 25% of the overall prison population. But when it comes to the youth justice system, it's 41%. And that is a massive rise as well in the last few years. So what he's suggesting is various steps are taken to try and increase the scrutiny on the courts in terms of sentencing. So that might involve uh, magistrates' decisions being uh, published, uh, court, uh, Crown Court sentencing uh, statements being published, and also a racial breakdown of those figures. And the idea is that that transparency uh, will increase trust in the system and enable people to point out where these problems are in real time rather than a review like this. I mean, he's also making the point that there's been a loss of faith, if you like, on both sides and that 
uh, hostility or suspicion of the judicial process sometimes means that uh, people from uh, minority backgrounds actually do themselves harm in the process of going through the criminal justice system. Yeah, exactly. And the impact of pleading guilty if you don't think you've got a, a fair chance or um, receiving a jail sentence as he's identified because you are uh, black, you have a higher chance of being uh, receiving a prison sentence are problems that he identifies. So he talks about trying to get local justice panels, for example, is one of the uh, recommendations to allow the local community to be more involved in that process and build trust that way. And another proposal that he was talking about just at the end there in that speech is with regards to criminal records. Now, uh, he connects the unemployment, uh, particularly amongst young people, with continued uh, involvement in criminal activities. And he says one of the problems is that these young people are... Uh, like being given criminal records and then are being hindered by them because many employers would not uh, employ someone with that. And so this would give them a chance to go to a court, prove uh, that they have changed and then have that uh, record sealed, which would give them yeah. a better chance of employment. What's the government saying about these proposals? The government are saying that they are going to look very carefully at the review's findings. We've heard that it's been very much welcomed by charities and the Labour Party. But this is what uh, the Minister David Lington had to say. Very large numbers of British people from our black and ethnic minority communities lack confidence in the criminal justice system. No minister, no government of any political colour can be happy with that state of affairs. We need to address that problem. Uh, David Lammy's recommendations offer a possible route for, for, for doing some of that and we'll be responding in detail to every item of his report. Tom, thanks very much indeed. Well, the report makes 35 recommendations in total, including allowing offenders to defer prosecution for some crimes if they agree to complete drug or alcohol rehabilitation courses. Introducing a national target to achieve a representative split amongst judges and magistrates, that's by 2025. And to bring in race-blind prosecuting, where possible, meaning police forces would withhold names and other identifying information from prosecutors. Well, joining me now to discuss the review is Dal Babu, former Chief Superintendent with the Met Police, and Dr Zubaydah Hack, Research Associate for the Runnymede Trust. Uh, welcome to you both. If I can start with you, Dal Babu, first of all. If you're in the criminal justice system, it's already too late, isn't it? I mean, many saying that, that an overhaul of the system is not what's required. It's more of a holistic approach. And what goes on before, especially youth, find themselves in the system? Well, absolutely. I mean, I was struck by the, the absence of involvement of the police in the report because the police are often the generators of, of the arrests that then bring the people into the criminal justice system. So I think that, that aspect, I think, is, is interesting uh, from its omission. But I think I'm also old enough now to have seen Scarman, Lawrence inquiry, um, the David Colbert Smith inquiry, the CRE inquiry. All these inquiries basically say the same thing. It's about having more representation, having more challenge, uh, setting targets. And we saw with the Stephen Lawrence inquiry that the government were prepared to accept all the recommendations and then abandon the recommendations around making the police more representative of the communities they serve. Now, I, I think we've had a fairly lukewarm response from the government at the moment around whether they're prepared to accept the recommendations. So I think right from the beginning, it doesn't look uh, particularly... Uh, it doesn't bode well that we're going to have the, uh, the, the recommendations implemented. I think in addition to that, uh, I think we just need, we, we don't need any more evidence. The evidence is there around how uh, BME people are, uh, are treated and their overrepresentation in the system. But I think there is a wider point here, is that some of the recommendations that you've just shown are already being used. So you can already defer an, a sentence if some, uh, on an alcohol programme or a, a drug uh, detox programme. But the difficulty is those things cost money. Uh, and it's about whether the government is prepared to put resources into those areas. And the final point I would make is this is, this, I think in some ways this goes beyond race. You know, if you're a white working class man or woman, if you've been a white working class man or woman in the care system, you would suffer similar kind of issues of disproportionality within the legal system and you would, would not trust the system as, as it is. Dr Zubaydah Hack, uh, it goes far beyond race and many of the recommendations we've actually heard before in reports that have gone before. 
Yes, I mean, I'm, I, um, hello, thank you for having me. Um, I, I completely agree with Adele that actually, in, in, um, in some ways, this report um, it can be seen from, from um, sort of uh, different, different perspectives. And of course, one is, is that it, it shouldn't be just taken as a race report, that many of the recommendations which the Runnymede Trust welcomes, many of Lamy's recommendations could be seen as recommendations that benefit both white working class communities, men and women, as well as black ethnic minority communities. Um, and and that's, that's an important point to take away from this report, because this isn't just about race. Um, there's significant racial discrimination within the criminal justice system. We know that. It's good to hear that again from Lamy. As, as Dow pointed out, there have been many, many reviews. But at the same time, there are also issues about lack of informed knowledge about the criminal justice system and how people unwittingly manage to penalise themselves as soon as they enter the system. Um, I think a, another point that Dow raised is a very good point, which is we also need to see the criminal justice system as the sharp end of sort of racial inequalities within society anyway. And, and we have to understand that because from, for some groups, especially for instance, um, the black community, from the moment they enter school, discrimination starts. So for instance, a young, a, a black boy can enter primary school at the same educational level as all other ethnic groups. But by the time, by the time he finishes um, secondary school, um, an average black boy is likely to, to achieve less well. Um, and, and that's a lot to do with systemic racial discrimination. Dalbabu, we had um, David Lammy speaking really about the lack of trust that uh, people from ethnic minorities have in the criminal justice system. How do you think that should be addressed? He also suggested perhaps looking at the recruitment of, of magistrates and judges. Is that going to be enough to redress the balance that he's outlined? Well, I think the first thing I think is Zabeda's point about sort of the, uh, the, the wider picture is really important. Uh, so even within this review, I think we've missed out a huge factor, i.e. The, the impact of the police. Uh, I think if you look at uh, what happened 30 years ago when I, uh, when I joined the police, there was no ethnic minority chief constables and there were no women chief constables. Now a quarter of all the chief constables are women and we still do not have a single uh, black um, or Asian chief constable. I, I think the figures speak for themselves. So we, we have a real problem around making sure we have representation so people feel confident about the system they're going into. So that lack of trust is, is extensive. But I think I, I, I'm perhaps a bit more cynical than perhaps some. I, I'd be very interested to see what changes happen. I've, been, I've lived through so many of these reports and we have a huge amount of coverage. We have sound bites. We have people saying how awful it is. Uh, we have people wringing their hands. Dad, uh, and then what would, we... what would, what would prevent your, your cynicism? Because you've made that point a, a couple of times that you've really seen it all before. What would really make you sit up and think, yes, this is progress? Well, I mean, I, I, I hope you're going to do this interview in a year's time with uh, some of the key individuals involved in this. Uh, and I think that, that's where you, pu you put pressure on these individuals and say, right, this report came out. And if you, if you were to interview the, the, the individuals in a year's time, it's a press that makes uh, the politicians feel uncomfortable. So I think the fact that you're giving this coverage, uh, I think it's just about making sure that you continue to shine a light on what's actually being delivered and what isn't being delivered. I mean, I, I, mean, I, li I live in Haringey. I think, it, as, and this is Zabeda's point, I think it's really, really important. It's that wider level of, di uh, of, of difference between different groups. Uh, I live in Haringey. Some children in Haringey would have had three or four holidays in the six weeks. Some children would have stayed in the borough for the entire six weeks. And so we need to be looking at the levels of deprivation, looking at how that impacts in the resources. And it's all very well talking about deferred sentences, but if you haven't got the drug rehabilitation places, if you haven't got the places that are going to support people with alcohol problems, then actually it's, it's, they're going to be just idle words. Actually, and I think we, we, have, we do quickly, have those kinds of things. Let's just quickly bring Dr Zabeda Hack in to, to round up here. Are you confident that the government will act on these recommendations very quickly? Well, Actually, actually, very quickly, I think there are, there are a couple of things that we need to take into account. One, it, one is the cuts. I mean, I think Dal is absolutely right to raise the issue about cuts across the system, because 
One of the reasons that previous reports haven't been implemented, one of, well, one of many reasons, one of the reasons is because recommendations aren't made within the context of what's happening within the criminal justice system. And we all know that the criminal justice system has been severely, severely and chronically um, underfunded. And I've been working in prisons for the last four years, and the reality is, is you have prison officers who have a choice at the moment. They can either choose to to um, monitor constantly someone who's at risk of self-harm or self-inflicted death, or they can deal with someone who's complaining about halal food in the servery and whether they're going to get it now or Dr. later. Dr. And Dr. it's Dr. because Vader there has. isn't enough... I'm afraid we must leave it there. We've run out of time, but obviously a very complex issue that uh, needs to stay under the magnifying glass. Thank you very much, Dal Babu and Dr Zubaydah Haq. Among young people in custody, the black, Asian and minority ethnic share has rocketed from 25% 10 years ago to 41% today. I have to say that I expected to find a laser-like focus on this issue. Instead, I found too much complacency. Uh, OK, let's talk to Samir Jiraj from the Race Equality Foundation. Uh, many thanks indeed for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, sorry, state of affairs, according to uh, Mr Lamy. Indeed, and you know the review shows uh, issues that you know people have been aware of for a number of decades now, but there really hasn't been the attention from government to dealing with these inequalities. Uh, what is more alarming, the fact that this report highlights this inherent bias in our judiciary system, or the lack of representation that we're seeing in the judiciary system, whether it's magistrates or judges? I mean, these are uh, both issues, and they both need to be tackled um, in order to in, in, in order to bring about a you know, greater level of, of equality within the criminal justice system. I would say that it's very concerning um, the rise in, in black and minority ethnic young people in the prison system. How do we address it? Well, it's a combination of, of factors and the, you know, the recommendations set out in, in the review do go a long way to addressing that. Um, but you know, quite deliberately, the, the review itself um, you know, sets limits around just being about the, um, the criminal justice system, um, whereas you know, more significant reform needs to happen within mental health, within education and within housing in order to really bring about the, the level of change that is needed. Uh, what about um, this idea of having more representation in the, in the judiciary? Uh, so you're seeing more black or ethnic minority uh, members of the public who are magistrates and, and who apply to be judges? I mean, that would be, that would be very welcome and that would you know, reflect a criminal justice system that is you know, um, made up of the, of the people you know, who are... Who, who are um, the members of the of the public? Um, I think it's you know it's very interesting that highlighted um, areas where where there's greater um, um, you know, lesser issues of inequality was around the the CPS and around the jury system, both areas in which um, you know representation is more reflective of the racial diversity of the UK. I guess at the, at the same time, you know, minorities can be biased as well. So that really doesn't fundament, uh, fundamentally uh, deal with the subconscious bias that people, white people, black people, Asian people, whatever, might have instilled in them from what could be a very early age. I mean, it, indeed, and that takes a, you know, a broader kind of systemic approach to, to um, unconscious bias and systemic um, institutional racism as well. I mean, you know, this, this review is, is one hopefully one big step along that journey um, but it is a journey and not just a um, simple quick fix. Um, do you think this report to some extent goes beyond race because if you look at a person uh, a white working class man um, who's born and raised in a particular environment he may well face the same challenges as somebody from a BAME group? Indeed it's important to to recognize those um, those you know, different levels and layers of, of inequality and you know, the UK prison system and criminal justice system it, itself is, has a, a lot of, of problems. We have a huge overcrowding issue in prisons in the, in the UK and I think and again another significant challenge for the UK is, is how, does it, how does it tackle that? Is it going to go down the route of building more prisons which you know, hasn't worked up to now or is it going to look to 
uh, Nordic countries where, um, for example, um, they're, they're, they're able to, to close down prisons because they've created a system that, that has so reduced uh, re-offending and so reduce the number of people ha having to go in that, um, that they're able to, to, to do that. OK, uh, Serena, many thanks indeed for joining us. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Young offenders from ethnic minorities will become the next generation of criminals unless the justice system is reformed. That's according to a review by a Labour MP that recommends delaying or dropping some prosecutions. David Lammy's report highlights how 25% of the prison population in England and Wales is from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. In the youth justice system last year, that figure is 41% compared to 14% of the general population. And for drug offences, those from BAME backgrounds were almost two and a half times more likely to be imprisoned. The government says it will look carefully at the suggestions, as Elaine Dunkley reports. HMP ISIS in south-east London. There's no hope in the system, basically. Yeah. There are more than 600 inmates. 70% of those behind bars here are from an ethnic minority background. Not getting bail, not getting, um, keep getting stopped in the circ because I'm black. According to today's review, the criminal justice system is stacked against them. It's how you're looked at, preconceptions, stuff like that. Stefan is serving six years for drug offences, but believes he's also been punished because of the colour of his skin. Well, I've been in prison for a while now, so I've met people in the past, when I first started my sentence, that got less time than me for a worse crime. Or the same drugs, but a lot worse than I've done, but they've got a shorter sentence than I have. According to the Lamy Review, statistically, the UK is worse than America when it comes to locking up people from ethnic minority backgrounds. When we're describing groups of young um, ethnic minorities, in particular black, the term gang is used, swathes of young people um, who may not necessarily be serious gang members, they may be um, affiliated, loosely affiliated to a gang, they may live in a gang neighbourhood, they may have been incorrectly labelled with that term, um, end up receiving harsher sentences. At Brixton Police Station, Shaquille is taking part in a rehabilitation scheme called Divert, which helps offenders find training and employment. You'll be surprised, yeah. I, I'm surprised that I've seen people as young as like 11, 12 smoking weed on the street. He says poverty is the root cause. In certain places where you go to, people just grow up with a mentality that's on the, they're on the battlefield. As a young person, to get involved in crime is just to better your circumstances. The Lamy Review has more than 30 recommendations for change. Proposals include removing identifying information about ethnicity when cases are passed from police to prosecutors so racial bias doesn't influence charging decisions and not declaring criminal records for minor offences when applying for jobs. I'm labelled 100%. If I go try to go for a job and I show them my criminal history record, whatever, they'll be like, yeah, this person, they can't get my job. The government says it is committed to making a fairer Britain a reality. Reviews and recommendations are a start. Now actions are needed to reform the character and culture of parts of the criminal justice system. Elaine Dunkley, BBC News. Bias and overt discrimination within the justice system could turn young offenders from ethnic minorities into the next generation of criminals. David Lammy has warned. His review has found evidence of bias throughout the system in England and Wales, from the courts to prison. The government has promised to look carefully at his 35 recommendations. Our senior Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, reports. A drug offence conviction, a year in prison and a hell of a struggle to rebuild his young Muslim life. 26-year-old Suleiman Ahmad found himself trapped in a system that offered little respite. How were you branded? because everywhere you would go for, for a job, you would be asked that question straight away. Do you have any previous criminal convictions? And the minute you're saying, yeah, the mentality around many young people in custody is the fact that now I've got a criminal record, no one's ever going to employ me because of that question that exists on every application form. I found that on the UCAS application form when I went to apply for university as well. He's now got a criminology degree and life's on the up. But David Lammy's review is all about those who haven't and whose futures are soldered to a criminal justice system 
that has ignored the racial disparity for too long. There is currently no evidence-based explanation for why you are more likely to go to prison if you are black, Asian or a minority ethnic person for a drug offence in our country. Many, I'm afraid, will conclude that this is evidence of bias. The stats make grim reading. Four out of every ten under 18s in custody are black, Asian or minority ethnic. That figure has doubled in the past decade. Black boys are ten times more likely than white to get arrested for drug offences. And black men are two and a half times more likely to get a prison sentence for drug convictions. And in prison, the review found, the bias continues. Black, Asian and minority ethnic men and women are less likely to say they've been treated with respect and more likely to report being victimised, threatened, hit, kicked or assaulted. Examples of Theresa May's burning injustices. If you're black, you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. And the consequence of that, Mr Lammy found... The, the whole system after that, the way you caught, you, the way your trials run, you, you set up to fail from the beginning. ...was that very large numbers in those communities have simply lost confidence in the criminal justice system. There's a blueprint for change, but arrives on the back of 30 years of previous attempts, like the 1998 Stephen Lawrence inquiry and the 2004 inquiry into the racist prison murder of Zahid Mubarak. Black and minority ethnic people are actually in many, many ways treated as second-class citizens. These are systemic issues which the Commission is working really, really hard to seek to address. Some of this can be dealt with by legislation. Some of it can be dealt with by bringing important test cases. Some of this is cultural. For Suleiman Ahmad, there may well have been benefits from the review's proposals to defer prosecutions or to seal criminal records. So if you take your Muslim, you've got convictions, you've got a degree, which one has had the most impact? Number one thing is being, having a criminal record. So being in custody was the thing that sort of overarches everything else, because that's what people tend to look at in terms of where I've once been. Um, yes, it was quite a few number of years ago, and since then I've moved on. Um, and I've got a degree and I've done what society sees as fit in a sense, but that still overshadows in the fact that... It's still overshadows? Yes, it does, and I still come across um, applications where I will have to say, yes, I have been in there, and then I'll never hear anything again. The warning from this review is clear. Without the political will to confront racial injustice, those about to enter the system will become the next generation of criminals. Well, earlier I spoke to David Lammy and I started by asking him what, in the course of his research, had shocked him most. I think the most shocking was the figures for young offenders. 41% of our youth prison population from a black or Asian minority ethnic background is terrible. And the reoffending rates, 46% for black boys coming back over and over again. So. Um, the, fig the, the trajectory is bad and going in the wrong direction. And why is that? Well, there's no silver bullet. There are lots of reasons. I mean, I think it is important to emphasise that there are a lot of issues beyond criminal justice in homes, in schools, school exclusion, pupil referral units, for example. But there are also issues in the criminal justice system. Clearly what's happening in our youth prisons and our prisons isn't actually working if recidivism rates and reoffending rates are as high as they are. Have you been radical enough? I think I've been radical. I think if we were sealing um, criminal records and not trapping um, offenders um, in prior convictions so they can't work, um, uh, that would be radical in our system. Our system's very, very rigid. And I think if we're deferring prosecutions, so we're not forcing the not guilty plea for first and second time offenders. We're actually getting on with solving the problem. Have you got a drug addiction? Have you got anger management issues? Do you need restorative justice with the victim? If we're getting on with that stuff, that would also be radical. Setting a target for prison governors and for judges is radical. The question is, will the government now accept my recommendations and do it? There are people out there who just think there is more criminality in black communities, that Muslim men are more likely to want to rape white girls,
Can you be sure that those things aren't true? Ten years ago, 25% of our youth prison population was from a black ethnic minority background. Today, it's 41%. I'm afraid uh, it, it, it can't just be because over ten years, the black community has a higher propensity towards crime. That does not make sense. And when you look at the figures, why is it that in prison you're less likely to get access to a job? Why is it in prison you're le less likely to get access to therapy, um, to education, if you are from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background? I'm afraid that doesn't make sense. And for all of those reasons, reoffending rates are higher. So there are issues of bias. There are issues of discrimination that are impacting on that reoffending. Why are black and minority ethnic communities disproportionately the victims of crime? Well, we're talking largely, I mean, crime in the end happens in poorer areas. There's a big correlation between crime and poverty. That's well established across every single criminology department in the world. Race and poverty go together. There are black Caribbean groups in our country, Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups particularly, that tend to be poor in Britain and they tend to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Have there not been moments when you've looked at these figures and just despaired? Absolutely. The wasted lives is devastating. The other thing that's devastating are communities in our country that reach a tipping point where too many of the men are unemployed because of a prior conviction. Um, where the trust levels are so low in the criminal justice system that the very foundation of criminal justice, i.e. legitimacy, has gone. Um, and where there is a sort of seeming bitterness that builds up towards power and authority. I think that's really dangerous and we've got some real challenges. And it's likely that if nothing is done in relation to my review, the adult prison population will get blacker and browner over the coming years. David Lamy, thank you very much. Thank you. The author of the report into the criminal justice system has told this programme he couldn't believe how complacent that sector was about race. Speaking to Newsnight as he published findings into an 18-month study into the ethnic breakdown of young offenders which showed a disproportionate number of young white people in jail, David Lamy said he was surprised at just how indifferent the whole system is to race. He calls for radical solutions for dealing with young offenders, including, in some cases, deferred sentences. Well, we'll hear from Mr Lamy in a moment. First, this report from David Grossman. Justice is often shown blindfolded. She's supposed to impartially weigh the evidence, irrespective of who stands before her. Today's report from the Labour MP David Lammy, but commissioned by the government, says we have a long way to go till we get to such an impartial legal system. Sean Bailey is a London Assembly member who advised the inquiry. It's well documented that the black men are treated more harshly. This report and its recommendations gives the criminal justice system a real serious direction of travel to address that properly. Let's be clear here, nobody's asking for special treatment, just equal treatment, and the recommendations are a real good look at how to do that. Mr Lamy's recommendations have two broad aims, increasing transparency and increasing trust. For the system, it says that where possible, identifying information should be redacted to make for race-blind decisions on cases. All sentencing remarks made in Crown Court should be published, along with a system for online feedback on judges. And prison staff and judges should be more representative of the population as a whole, with a national target of a representative judiciary by 2025. In twos all facing this way? Guys, I'm talking, we're not listening. Bobby Kasanga now runs a football club for youngsters in Hackney, East London. He says he's turned his life around, having spent eight years in prison. He was convicted of conspiracy to rob security vans. Get your heels up, the heel flicks, heel flicks. Black men like Bobby are 50% more likely to plead not guilty in court than white men. It's a big reason, says today's report, that black men have on average longer sentences. You go into court believing straight away that they're not going to believe anything I say. I might be telling the honest God truth and they'll still be against me. So we believe that it's us versus them at, at, at certain points. Is that why you pleaded not guilty? So originally on my first case, I pleaded not guilty because I was young, I was naive. I was like, well, 
I think I can get away with this. I'm going to go not guilty. And I don't think I was given the advice from my solicitor or lawyers to tell me that maybe just plead guilty, you get a lighter sentence. For individuals, the review recommends that reformed offenders should be able to apply to have their criminal records sealed so they don't have to disclose them to future employers. Young offenders should be assessed for their maturity to inform sentencing decisions. And, controversially, low-level offenders should be allowed to defer prosecution and opt for a rehabilitation programme even before they enter a plea, so they don't even have to admit guilt. You en enable people who've taken a wrong turn to be able not to have the stigma of a criminal record for the rest of their life if they take steps to resolve the problems that they've had and rehabilitate. But more importantly, we have that process in our system already. Two examples, conditional cautions occur. People, someone has to admit guilt, but they can avoid a conviction if they take certain steps pursuant to a conditional caution. And we also have deferred prosecutions in relation to organisations involved in serious fraud. What's great about this review is it's taking concepts that are out there and trying to find interesting, innovative ways to apply them to a problem that it hasn't been applied to before. For Bobby Kasanga, one of the biggest problems that young black men face with the criminal justice system is a perception of bias rather than a reality. The jury was all white jury, the judge was white. Um, funnily enough, the prosecutor was actually black, which sort of was a, it's a bit of a, um, a funny one, but I was sort of looking at the prosecutor like, come on, give me a chance, mate. Like, you're one of us sort of thing, but he was working for the, uh, for the court system. And what was your experience of the outcome, the sentence that you received? Um, to be fair, the judge was pretty lenient on me. I thought I was going to get more. Everyone was scaring me, saying, well, for conspiracy to rob cash and transit fans, you're looking at nine years, ten years. So when the judge actually gave me uh, the four years initially, I was like, well, I've got a touch there, so maybe I've got a chance now to change my life around. Go! The ideal solution, according to Bobby, is not really about reforming the criminal justice system. It's about what he's dedicating himself to now, making sure young black men don't end up in that system in the first place. David Grossman there. Will any talk of sentences or deferred sentences for the first or second offence ask the system to prioritise the needs of wrongdoers over those of victims of crime? So how comfortable would David Lammy be to see that going down the route? And how surprised was he by what he found? I didn't expect to find that the figures for young offenders were quite as bad as they are. I mean, if 41% of our youth prison population is from a black ethnic or minority ethnic background, that's heading to half of our prison estate. And I think the worst thing about it is the reoffending rate. 46% reoffending means that, frankly, the system isn't really working because people are coming back. So there are big questions about what's happening in our youth prisons. You raise the question in your report of maturity. Do you think our definition, the legal age of, of young offenders is wrong. I met 18 and 19 year olds sitting in adult prisons um, and they're clearly in adult prisons mixing with some very very serious criminals indeed. These were young men that often couldn't really assess risk and risky behaviour, um, were impulsive, spontaneous, poor at making judgments about peer group and all of the modern evidence on the teenage brain and the, the, the development, if you like, of the youthful brain is that you really sort of settle down at about 25. And so, so should young offenders still be classified as such up to the age of 25? Well, what I'm recommending is that, like the German system, there is an assessment of maturity by independent um, psychiatrists and psychologists able to make that judgment about whether that young person ought to be in the youth estate. We all grew up in the shadow of the McPherson report. The term he used was institutionalised racism. Now, you don't call it that this time. Do you believe, at its heart, it is racism? I did find bias, evidence of bias, and I did find evidence of overt discrimination, particularly in the prison system. I wasn't asked to do an inquiry into racism in the criminal justice system. I was asked to do a review, and I said that it had to be evidence-led. Um, 
and, and very much you're looking at the academic evidence, you're spending time in prisons, you're speaking to people, you're really making assessment of the figures and the data that's not been revealed before. And my judgment was is that absolutely there is bias still in the criminal justice system. But you don't system. use the term racism it's for a reason why. It's because it was very hard for me to get into the minds of those who are actors in a very big system. In the end, our country has tended to focus on policing. My review was everything after policing. So what I'm suggesting is you intervene earlier with something called deferred prosecutions. You, you deal straight right away with the person who's committed that crime. I mean, you can only do this for those with first and second time offences. It's very hard, isn't it, to turn round to, say, the victim of a mugging or whatever it is and say, sorry, at this point it makes more sense to put the culprit first. The evidence from the pilot, the uh, turning point pilot in the West Midlands, is that victims like this system. Because I suspect for first and second time offences, where it's not you know, it's not very serious violent crime. Um, they, what they want is action. They but want that young doing, person then, off dope. David, they want you... that young person not sort of smashing but up their cars. But you're taking the punishment element out. Is that right? I mean, the, by deferring a prosecution, you're basically turning to the person who's done it and said, it's all right. We actually use deferred prosecution for serious fraud. Um, um, because the state doesn't want to do huge big fraud trials that cost a fortune, we go to the CEO that's just mismanaged funds and we ask them to defer prosecution, to, to, to work with the system if you like, to fess up um, where are the bodies buried and we defer prosecution. And a lot of people would and find that incredibly distasteful. That is what we do in this country. So, I mean, I do think that if the system isn't working, if recidivism rates are 46% for black men, then something isn't working. Do you feel comfortable, though, with saying we may become a system which prioritises wrongdoers over victims? Do you feel comfortable saying we're not going to tell employers about criminal records? Is it fair on an employer? Is it fair on that employer who might have a duty of care to his other members of staff? How far along that road would you feel comfortable going? Well, I'm thinking of the scales and justice and I'm thinking of balance. Um, I worry a lot about young people particularly trapped in a culture of criminality because they can't get employment. 50% of employers say that they wouldn't employ someone with a criminal record. I might say also my recommendations are for everyone. I was asked to look at disproportionality for black and Asian and minority ethnic people, but a lot of my recommendations are for everyone. And we ought to think about more flexibility, or I'm afraid we're building in unemployment for large tracts of the country, not just uh, 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 black and Asian minority ethnic, but for white working class populations as well. When you look at this mistrust of systems that you've reported on, do you share some of those suspicions? I was surprised at how indifferent the system is to race. If you were in a London comprehensive, it would be impossible uh, frankly, not to meet head teachers and staff, the local authority, they're all over the data. The education world is looking at the data and trying to get results. I couldn't believe how complacent the criminal justice um, sector was about what is obvious. David Lamy, thank you. Thank you. I've been getting